Well, good evening, everyone. As many of you will know, I, I run a newsletter which uh, comes out about monthly just before the the meeting. So if anybody's not on that and would like to be, uh, would they like to come up afterwards and fill in the email on on this uh, this form? I always ask. I always ask for it to be uh, legible because ever so often I get home and find I key it into the computer and I, I can't make it out. Anyhow, it's my pleasure this evening to to welcome Sean O'Connor, who's a speaker. Um, his four four book series, The Secrets of Life, from Big Bang to Trump, was published last year, and uh, we have examples here, and they're available for. Ten ninety nine each, or forty pounds for the four, and they'll be on sale uh, downstairs as you're leaving. Sean's talk will principally focus on how game theory illustrates the risk and reward processes that are constantly running behind our psychology, and why the behaviour in life is actually not unlike a poker game. <clears throat> he will close by explaining why the evidence suggests that our world is improving fast in spite of our, our anxieties and why we might even view the future with confidence. So I'm very much looking forward to this. I think it's my kind of philosophy, which is that uh, philosophy should really be belonging in science rather than in the humanities. Sean. Okay, you're strolling down Milson Street tomorrow. When a man with a clipboard comes up and asks if you'd like to earn £10,000 for an hour's work, hey, why not? So he takes you up to a big room he's hired over the ivy, and when you arrive, it's already full with about 30 people. You look around, but there's nobody there you know. Listen, everybody, he says, we're doing some research into the social dilemma. And in this experiment, each one of you will be guaranteed £10,000 if you can all stay quiet for one hour. But, 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 if someone breaks the silence by shouting out, then that person will get £5,000 and everybody else will get nothing. Okay, the time starts now. Of course, you and your new pal sit there smiling at each other. Ten grand for just shutting up. But after a few minutes, you start taking a closer look at the others. Hmm, not great. That woman, she seems weird. Why is she pulling those faces? And that fellow holding his head. Maybe he's claustrophobic, run out in a minute, shrieking. Before long, people are starting to look, each other, look at each other in a horribly tense way. They're all obviously wondering what's going on. But you're thinking too. You know nothing about any of these characters. So who's to say what strange motivations some of them may have? And you know that there are some nut jobs that really have to win in life. Nothing they'd like more than letting us get our hopes up and then putting one over on the rest of us. Maybe that's why this man in the corner is smirking so much. You force yourself to think logically. Yes, you definitely all want the money, but who's to say if everyone in the room can be trusted? You only have to be wrong in your judgment about one of them. And they'll all be like you in knowing that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. The 5,000 pounds is certain. The 10,000 is uncertain. And getting nothing would make this exercise a real waste of time. But the others might also be like you in working out that the risks of staying silent are fairly considerable and that it could actually pay to shout out. In fact, one of them might be coming to that conclusion pretty soon. But you're smarter than the rest of them, aren't you? You shout out. Now, should you be disgusted with yourself for making this decision? Possibly. But what's more to the point is that you're recognizing the social dilemma that's at work here. Seeing through to one of the big truths in life, that it's so often a tug of war between what's good for the group, the team, society as a whole, and what's good for the individual. That although winning can sometimes appear selfish, not losing is pretty important too. But here's the question. How would you have behaved if there'd been people in the room that knew you? Your calculations would probably have changed then because your reputation as a straight shooter would have mattered. But this was a one-off game with strangers you were never going to see again. Weighing up the factors that lead people to make these kind of decisions is what game theory is all about. 
Its underlying idea is to see how the risk and rewards in choice situations can be measured, often mathematically, and to decide on the best outcomes. In humans, it's the examination of the logic that's unconsciously running through our heads and how this results in our psychology. And whether we like it or not, it shows us how we're always trying to win. Is that right, though? Do we really have to win? Can't we just bumble along? Well, up to a point, but the fact remains that each one of us is the same as everything else in life, programmed by our genes to survive and reproduce. And since biologists reckon that 99.9% .9 of all the species that have ever existed would eventually become extinct, we latecomers must have learned one or two things about how to survive, how to win. I know most of us are thinking, yuck, I'm not even competitive. But the key thing to recognize is that while the selfish gene may be focused on helping the vehicles that carry it around be successful, because this is how life keeps going, there are two quite different ways of arriving at the decisions that things make when they interact. The first is what game theorists call zero sum, because one thing simply beats another. I win, you lose. But while beating something sounds good, the problem with this choice is that nothing's ever added, nothing's ever built. The alternative is called non-zero sum, and this is where things cooperate. They help each other to win, so that everything wins together. We humans instinctively think that cooperation means being moral, trusting, caring. But organisms in nature don't have thoughts and feelings like us. And for them, zero sum and non-zero choices are just two survival strategies mm -hmm. that are being pursued at every second of every day. Sounds bizarre put like that. And yet, is it any odder that knowing that however complex the digital age may be, everything that happens is at base only due to a binary choice of one or zero? And biologists tell us that non-zero cooperation has been behind every evolutionary advance and every major transmission in the history of the world. Why is that? It's because ed everything is endlessly trying to resist entropy, the energy loss prescribed by the second law of thermodynamics. In a world where all interchanges are inefficient and all organic matter is destined to fall apart, every life form is constantly incentivized to make one plus one equal three. We humans might make logical decisions to influence our evolution, but everything else came about because of the genes trick of allowing mistakes to crop up in the replication process. This is what leads to mutations and why life may have started out as just one cell 3.8 billion years ago, but we now have parrots and spaniels, wisteria and E. coli and 8.7 million other species. So yes, organisms may have ended up blindly deciding on what to be, single-celled or multi-celled, living in air or water and so on. But everything is also constantly interacting with what's around it, forming ecological associations and symbioses and creating places in which they can survive and hopefully be safe. This happens because everything in life has also evolved to behave in different ways. Some become parasites, for example, living off others. Further up the spectrum, instead of killing their host, Virulence reduces to where they don't do any harm. And in turn, this then moves on to where there are mutual benefits between the parties, and eventually to altruism, where organisms are actively helping each other. In fact, everything in life is in a relationship with other members of their species, but also with the other species around them. This is how ecological niches come about. But while symbioses have evolved to be critical to many life cycles, what each party gets out of the arrangement often looks unfair to us. One side usually seems to be far better off than the other. But are we humans really so different in our relationships? We may try to balance the benefits when we work together, but the truth is that we spend much of our lives accepting less than we'd like, although we're still getting enough out of the deal to keep us quiet. As an example, here's something that's known to game theorists as the ultimatum game. So say there are two guys called Pete and Tom. And for some reason, I think Pete should be rewarded with a thousand pounds. But I also ask him to share the amount with Tom, who's been helping him. How much he hands over is up to him. Now, when Pete has to do it with lots of people looking on, and his reputation as a fair and decent person is on the line, he'll give Tom far more than if he does it in secret, without anybody knowing his decision. 
Under those circumstances, he might think, well, I'll give him a hundred quid. He'll never know how much I got. But suppose the secret does come out. Ah, suppose Tom discovers that Pete only handed over a tenth of what he'd been given. What would his reaction be to discovering this? What had seemed like a nice sharing gesture would now look like a cheap betrayal. And if Tom tells people, Pete's reputation is likely to be trashed. Game theorists explore scenarios like this mathematically. And how the ultimatum game works is that if Tom considers he's not being treated fairly, he feels humiliated by being offered too small a share, then not only can he refuse the amount, but by turning it down, he can punish Pete by making sure that he gets nothing as well. What happens in long run research? Fascinating. Studies can track people's responses and actually measure the degree to which the lure of hard cash affects their view of their own sense of self-worth. And what the results show is that people will reject what they're offered if they think the share split is too unreasonable or unfair, even if they could really do with the money. The great majority of people would rather not get anything if turning it down means they can see the nasty, selfish person that's making the insulting offer suffer as well. Remarkable. So what do you think is the level at which the inferior partner, the Tom character, thinks that getting hold of something, even if it's not half, overcomes his dislike of the person who's so grudgingly handing it out? All the research seems to arrive at the same general conclusion, that anything under about 35% of the pot is routinely rejected, and anything over this is a deal, and cooperation sets in, however grumpy it might leave one. The same principle is seen throughout the natural world. It means that although symbiotic benefits might suit both parties, the rewards are usually so unbalanced that the associations are rarely free of tensions. So what about our evolutionary story? We humans have always lived with similarly unbalanced social contracts in our communities. But why do we put up with so much unfairness? Well, an overview of human history shows that the big man, the big men, who controlled our groups acted in contradictory ways when it came to sharing out group gains. Yes, they'd certainly have wanted to make their societies efficient with things like the division of labor, group childcare and pair bonding, but they sure didn't want anything that would ever undermine their authority. This meant they were terrified of allowing activities such as peaceful specialization and exchange with neighboring tribes because this would have allowed outside influences to come in dangerous new memes that the big man couldn't control or sanction. In other words, he'd have sat on trading, innovation, social change, and particularly the idea of ever viewing outsiders as potential customers rather than the enemy. Give or take a bit, this totally top-down, presumptuous micromanaging picture was only increased when agriculture came along. Yes, population sizes boomed beyond the tiny scale of hunter-gatherer tribes, but this just saw the big man reinforce his authority with layers of nobility, landowners, soldiers, thugs, priests, and teachers, all of whom rammed home the unfair social contract and the iron belief that our rulers would tell us what to think and behave. And this is how we lived unchanged for millennia before a social earthquake erupted 600 or so years ago with the invention of mass printing. This is because people who could read suddenly realized they weren't alone in having dark thoughts about how they were being ruled. And what were they thinking? Nothing less than the ultimatum game. Why are we doing all the work and getting so little while the boss class owns everything and treats us with such contempt? Well, we all know that this led to mass questioning, to anger, pressure, and the influence of the major social contract thinkers like Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. And from them to 300 years of Pete and Tom standoffs, uprisings and revolutions that reset the status quo. Mm -hmm. And roughly about the same time as Rousseau came that brilliant weirdo, Adam Smith, who went from mad professor to superstar when he had a massive hit in his mid thirties with a how to be happy book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Sounds more unpick upable than unput downable but its message about how to improve by climbing into the skin of other people and seeing yourself through their eyes had a huge impact. However, he was then to completely baffle his admirers with a rambling megatome called the wealth of nations because it appeared to contradict what he'd said before. 
instead of us having to think about ourselves and how we behave, he was now saying that as long as we were protected by good laws and fair regulations, then morality would naturally arise as we traded with one another. This was because we'd act in our self-interest and the invisible hand of the market would produce an acceptable division of responsibilities and benefits. And that instead of the grabbing, rioting, chaos, and all the other social contract revolutions that the world was witnessing, there'd be order and an ethical society. Whoa. All good stuff, but it didn't take long for people to notice that Smith had changed his mind. Should we try to be empathetic, as he told us in his first book, or should we be looking out for our own interests, which is what his second said? It was the £5,000 and £10,000 game in a nutshell. And this social dilemma was to spend decades as a philosophical football, being kicked around by the political theorists, and in particular by the German gloommeisters of the 19th century, who called it Das Adam Smith problem. But the revolutions eventually settled, and there wasn't really to be anything particularly new on the matter for another 150 years. But then came an astonishing polymath called John von Neumann, who was convinced that if one could give values to the choices in these dilemmas and set alternative outcomes as options, then it must be mathematically possible to see which strategies succeeded in life. He called his new science game theory, and the idea behind it was that if these life decisions were subject to rules and players' moves, then we could analyze what it takes to win. But Neumann was a fascinating man who'd been recruited to Princeton in the early 1930s. Yet even in the company of Einstein, Oppenheimer, Dirac, Caudel, and Feynman, he was known as the cleverest man who ever lived. Eventually, a joke took hold that he was actually an alien who'd come down to study the feeble earthling but had liked it so much he decided to stay. As well as arriving at endless mathematical proofs, he could speak multiple ancient and modern languages, was a confidential advisor to US governments, and is recognized as the father of computing. Here he is in the late 1930s with one of his machines. And if you think it looks vaguely familiar, you might remember something sim similar in the imitation game with Benedict Pump Cumberbatch playing Alan Turing. In reality, Turing worked with von Neumann when he was doing his doctorate at Princeton. And your own computer almost certainly runs on what's known as von Neumann architecture. Sadly, he was to die in his 50s. And here's a late picture of him in a wheelchair with President Eisenhower and another of Dr. Strangelove, a character that was largely based on him. But there was one thing he could never master, and it drove him mad because it was his great passion. It was poker and in particular, a popular variant called Texas Hold'em, where there's a mix of face-up and face-down cards. Something he saw as a parallel, how we stumble along in life imp with imperfect information, bluffing as we go, trying to protect ourselves and yet attempting to win without exposing ourselves to too much risk. And so he now turned whatever energies he could spare from developing the atom bomb to picking apart this wildly complicated picture of life. Were people really being sincere when they were choosing to be cooperative? Or perhaps they were simply biding their time in still they could suddenly cheat when they'd lulled the other side into trusting them. Is an arm round the shoulder a warm gesture or a way of sticking a knife in? This kind of zero sum beating the opposition is what game theorists call defecting. In summary, the whole process of life, he said, was actually not unlike how poker is played. His first thought was to explore how individuals would behave if they were completely unemotional players who were only focused on winning. His proof was depressing. If people were utterly opposed, his theorem found, they'd always take up positions to minimize the maximum damage that could be done to them. He called the outcome minimax and described it as avoiding the worst is the best we can hope for. But like your decision to shout out in the room over the ivy, Minimax operates in a zero-sum, one-time game, a single episode that ends there. To trust someone under such solitary, cliff-edge circumstances is irrational. Bleak though the Minimax proof might have been, it soon led to another of the Princeton math geniuses to start exploring whether the outcome could be influenced if one introduced elements of non-zero cooperation. Maybe there'd be a different result if there was a chance of communication. 
This man was the extraordinary John Nash. And here he is around the time he was working on his doctorate in the late 1940s. And here's Russell Crowe playing him in A Beautiful Mind. Yet even when discussion was possible, Nash found a similar outcome to Minimax was unavoidable. He condensed his conclusions on negotiating tactics into an astonishing PhD dissertation of just 28 pages. And in it, he arrived mathematically at the point that's since become renowned as the Nash equilibrium. This was when neither party had any incentive to change their decisions. There'd be an impasse. Both could probably see that they'd be better off if they altered their approach, if they were more cooperative, in other words, Yet neither of them would change their position because they were fearful that the other side might then take advantage of them. However, instead of Minimax and the equilibrium staying in the rarefied world of academic discussion, these intellectual dead ends were to become only too real with the onset of the Cold War. That was because the American government had set up a think tank called the Rand Corporation to outwit the Soviets, outthink them. And von Neumann and Nash were prominent members and game theory was at its core. It was this group's thinking that was to come up with a version of the equilibriums that was called mutually assured destruction, or MAD for short. And much as people might have disliked the idea, it held off nuclear annihilation. Since neither superpower could win a war if these weapons went the logic, there was actually a positive benefit in having similar thermonuclear capabilities on each side. Yet while that might have been true, there was an ever-increasing anxiety as the years passed that a Dr. Strangelove type accident might occur. It didn't take much for minor cock-ups and miscalculations to bring down the curtain on the whole world. Zero-sum warfare could become negative-sum in the blink of an eye. So how could one side reach out a sharing hand to the other if an initiative was always going to be interpreted as a sign of weakness? Well, the answer was going to come from another pair of the RAN brain boxes, Merrill Flood and Melvin Drescher, who were working together on irrationality analysis when they dreamt up the most subtle and revealing of games. Ones, they thought, that could explore the interplay between zero-sum and non-zero motivations in a way that had never been managed before. The game was a version of the scene in a thousand cop movies where two criminals were kept apart after they'd been arrested and seduced by the police interrogator with incentives to shock their mate. In game theoretic notation, five points were on offer for confessing to the crime, while the person who kept his mouth shut would get nothing, and a long sentence, or what game theorists call the sucker's payoff. If they both confessed, then each would get a reduced sentence, one point in the game. And if each of them refused to speak, then they'd both get three points. The Rand boys called it the prisoner's dilemma, and it's been fascinating social scientists, evolutionary biologists, and philosophers ever since. Of course, everyone soon realized that playing defect, that's confessing, had to be the logical thing to do, and this became known as the dominant strategy. This was because you'd win, you'd get five points, if the other play person played cooperate and stayed silent, but you could still be certain of a single point if the other person also chose to defect. Nonetheless, the non-zero gains of three point each were being dangled in front of the thieves' noses. If only they could find a way of overcoming the trust barrier. However, when researchers ran laboratory trials with real people playing real games, they found that the gains that came from cooperation were just too great for these test subjects to endlessly persist in playing defect. And it was at this point that von Neumann's great invention came into its own, the computer. And it wasn't long before game theorists realized that different strategies could be programmed in to see which decisions would win in the long term over multiple plays rather than just in one offs. If the game wasn't seen as an abyss into which one could fall, so much as an opportunity to learn something about the other side, would an iterated prisoner's dilemma, known technically as an IPD, throw up different results? If decision-making situations were repeated, would the parties alter their behavior and attempt to get some joint benefits rather than just being stuck in an equilibrium of suspicion and conflict? In other words, academics began looking to see 
if cooperation would evolve with knowledge. The great surprise for researchers was to see how people reached out to cooperate. But surely playing defect would take advantage of such a trusting opponent, they said. If someone's always choosing defect and the other person suddenly plays cooperate, then doesn't five points come to the defector while the naive cooperator gets the black eye of no score? Think on that. Was repeated defection really such a clever thing to do? Who in the real world wants a relationship with someone who's flatly, endlessly difficult, only thinking of themselves and resistant to the gains that can come from being collaborative? They'd soon be seen as an intransigent, impossible type, and ultimately, very few of us would ever want to deal with them. In short, we'd avoid them. Because why would you ever want to be in a relationship with someone who was always determined to beat you? By rights, the Nash equilibrium should have led to always defect. Yet it was also plain that however much one might have imagined that cold-blooded opponents would reach the conclusion that it was rational to defect, the same deep desire for one plus one to equal three that seen in the symbioses of the natural world was making test subjects find it more rational to make cooperative gains. This is perhaps one of the great insights of life, that it's rational to be irrational and to hold out the hand of trust, but only if there's an opportunity to punish someone if they then defect it. But what these early trials also showed was that if the game was played a finite number of times, say a hundred rounds, then it was logical to defect on the hundredth game, because this was an opportunity to gra grab five points if the other person was playing cooperate. Why is that? It was because they couldn't then be punished for their decision. Since there was no hundred and first turn, the cooperator couldn't play defect back. But since that's obvious to everyone, shouldn't they then logically defect on the 99th go? And since this was equally obvious, why not on the 98th choice? Or maybe earlier, where would it stop? Game theorists call this a backward induction paradox, but the rest of us know it as treachery. But why would people ever want to deal with you? How insulting, eh? It's because you're trustworthy. You've built a reputation for being sincere. And this means you're the sort who deals with people who've also proved themselves to be trustworthy. The situation that game theorists would term always cooperate. And if the game, game is played repeatedly, it now becomes logical to cooperate. It was hardly surprising, therefore, that researchers were finding that when they switched their focus away from simultaneous choices and towards sequential ones, the best results came when people were able to assess their opponents before they embarked on playing, even if it was just with a glance. The dilemma had begun as a high stakes conflict between committed antagonists, but it was now becoming ever clearer that people were seeing what the potential was for coming to arrangements with others, interpreting the history of their interactions and focusing on what the joint outcomes might be over the long run. This was why cooperators would persist with someone rather than ditching them as not worth the effort. All very interesting, you may be thinking, but give me a break. Everyone knows the unpleasant truth that it's the strong and ruthless who win in life, not the trusting sorts who patiently wait for reciprocity. Was that right, though? Game theorists now began to call these zero-sum types hawks, and when they played the IPD with cooperators, doves, they did indeed quickly kill them. But with the dove numbers now greatly reduced, the hawks would then find themselves meeting other hawks like themselves. And because being zero sum was how their minds were, with their baked in need to control and dominate and win, the hawks then couldn't stop themselves from killing other hawks. It was at this point that a type of cooperator called a retaliator dove emerged. These would play like a hawk when they were up against a hawk. But when they met a dove, they'd play cooperate. And hawks didn't all come in one size either. Some were truly committed zero summers, but others might have defected out of insecurity or even error, what game theorists call trembling hands. And researchers found that when the IPD was played without an endpoint, these people would return to cooperate if they could. And so researchers found that a cycle would repeatedly turn with hawk and dove populations ebbing and flowing. As the 1970s progressed, Computer programs about to how to win at the dilemma were spreading to other disciplines. Evolutionary biologists were taking a particular interest. 
And Robert Trivers, the great American geneticist, proposed that the same Hawks and Dove mechanism was behind the symbiotic strategies of creatures in the natural world. Who got what benefits, in other words? His view was that over long periods of time, species evolved to employ what he termed reciprocal altruism, in which different organisms would live together, helping each other. Nonetheless, just like us, to tr trust something enough to do this, they had to be able to identify defectors and then to punish them if they took more than the agreed amount. And the British evolutionary theorist, John Maynard Smith, then came up with the most extraordinary insight that the great cycle of hawks and doves was actually a Nash equilibrium and was what lay behind the balance of nature. If making the right decisions in life led to increases in fitness, he argued, then population dynamics had the same result as our human rationality. Conflict or cooperation would be chosen by a living thing in a similar mechanism to the way in which humans picked a strategy they thought would win a game. Organisms didn't have to be aware they were making decisions or playing games, but nonetheless, their reproductive success and genetic fitness arrived at exactly the same place that payoffs did in The Prisoner's Dilemma. By the late 1970s, scientists from a wide range of fields were hammering away at their computers, each convinced that the formula for winning in life could be investigated with the logic of the dilemma. All of them were asking whether it was possible to find the right balance between individual and collective ambitions. And then a young American superstar social scientist called Robert Axelrod had a brainwave. Why not, he thought, hold a competition to see which approach would get the most points? This led to him running two rounds of tournaments in which there were 76 entrants in all. Incredibly, they were both won by the simplest strategy, just four lines of code that had been submitted by a Ukrainian concert pianist turned mathematician called Anatole Rappaport. The optimal way to play, he said, was ridiculously simple. Never be the first to defect. If you play first, then open with cooperate. After that, repeat whatever the other player does. Axelrod immediately called it tit for tat. What Rappaport's strategy dictated was that one should start by trusting the other person, therefore play cooperate. If the other person trusts in return, then they'll play cooperate back. And you'd also then reply with this again. If both of you keep doing this, you'll be racking up six points between you. It was the polar opposite of the prisoners in their cells. What was logical in an iterated dilemma would have been illogical in a one-time game. However, if the other person had gone first and opened with defect, or if he betrays you by suddenly switching from cooperate to defect in mid-game, so snatching five points instead of three, then you should immediately move to play defect in return. But if he then holds out an olive branch and shifts back from defect to cooperate, you should instantly follow his lead and revert to cooperate yourself. Tip for tap wasn't so much a strategy to use against an opponent mm -hmm. as an invitation to become a trusted partner, and it couldn't have been more successful. Axelrod realized that the strategy exposed a profound evolutionary and philosophical insight in that it showed how cooperation was bound to expand. That's because people will settle down to play always cooperate when they feel they can trust each other. Put it its simplest, doing so results in an easier life. You don't have to be constantly on your guard. Cooperative individuals then spread throughout society and citizens inevitably become more moral. When he came to write about these findings in his great book, The Evolution of Cooperation, Axelrod chose to describe tit for tat's robust achievements in human terms. First, he said it was nice in that the strategy meant that one was never the person to initiate defection. Then secondly, it was provocable because it could immediately retaliate if the other person played defect, but it also immediately forgives if the opponent reverted to choosing cooperate. It didn't bear a grudge, in other words, just stuck to its tactic of always following the choice of the other person. Then came perhaps the most surprising of its insights. Axelrod summarized it as, don't be envious. This is because tit for tat means that however many points you end up with, you can never score more than the other person. At best, all you can hope for is that you're as good. Wow, that seemed to be so weird and counterintuitive. How can you win by drawing or coming second? It's because tit for tat succeeds by consistently racking up big scores by playing with a wide variety of partners 
Don't worry about individual battles, Rappaport was saying, but instead take the long view and concentrate on finding a number of different cooperative players. Then you can come out on top by picking up three points from all of them over lengthy periods of time. Next, Axelrod pointed out the great strength of tit for tat was that it couldn't be more open and clear. Instead of having intricate secret strategies, its whole approach was designed to tell people exactly what you were doing and what they could expect from you. He called this final lesson, don't be clever, don't be enigmatic or tricky. Tit for tat was therefore a strategy that rewards cooperators and educates defectors. When it appeared, people immediately saw that tit for tat was a game theoretic way of describing what religions term the golden rule. In essence, it was showing how reciprocity could be given ethical clothes, because this is how we arrive at the moral obligation that you should treat others as you'd like to be treated yourself. Even so, there was a great paradox at work here. Yes, we love the trustworthy, the compassionate, the sharers in life, and yes, we hugely admire altruists and want as many of them in our societies as possible. So why aren't more of us like this? So the obvious reason that while it suits us to be the object of other people behaving in this way, it costs us to be constantly handing it out ourselves. We like it and praise it in others. We don't want to run the risk of being taken advantage by overdoing it. All good, but there was a major problem. Because game theorists now realize that while tit for tat prescribes how we should deal with each other, it also contained a weakness that undermined its entire rationale. What if the exchanges got stuck in a state of mutual defection? When defect is met with defect, which is returned with defect, and so on and on and on, we all know that this ends up in horrors like angry intransigence, interminable quarrels, feuds, and vendettas. Then a brilliant mathematician called Martin Nowak found himself pondering, if random mutations can unblock evolutionary logjams, perhaps random forgiveness could act in the same way to unblock tit for tat's big shortcoming. Was it possible, he wondered, that if one didn't always respond to defect with defect, but sometimes randomly forgave and played cooperate instead, then it would quickly become apparent if any defectors wanted to come in from the dark. Noah ran the numbers and immediately found that he'd hit the evolutionary jackpot because forgiveness allowed the less committed hawks to return to cooperation. So what did all this add up to? Possibly above everything else, game theory had illustrated the rather unpalatable conclusion that the real reason we humans are ever virtuous in life is because, like every other species in nature, we are calculating selfish organisms whose base motive is to survive and prosper. But put bluntly, cooperation is a winning strategy. Although we've now evolved to think so quickly that we no longer notice the reasoning that goes on behind our choices, we can still see that it's our profound need for social collaboration that's driving our inexplicably empathetic nature. Surely here is Das Adam Smith problem run to ground. Secondly, although we think that selfish toughs behavior must be right, after all, how can winning three points ever be better than getting five? This approach only wins in the short term. Zero-sum defectors like this are recognized and avoided. A defector mindset can lead to a bad reputation, to unpopularity and social exclusion. Just as in the natural world, being unattractive makes finding a mate harder. Defectors' offspring are likely to be excluded as well. The long squeeze on their numbers is underway. And in short, zero-sum defection has shown itself to be evolutionary suicide over long enough periods of time. Is this such a weird conclusion to come to? I know it sure seems a foolhardy inference as one wearily witnesses the terrible people who are so often spoiling our lives. But the point is, not everyone is like them. We know what committed defectors look like. We've developed mechanisms for identifying them and judicial systems designed to punish them. We've written laws to protect the unwary. We warn each other and we do the million and one other things that shape a world of cooperation and the punishment of abuse. We want to be altruistic, collaborative, and happy, because then other people who are like this will want to deal with us. Doing so makes us attractive. But we also have to be genuine. Each of us has the capacity for zero sum or non-zero choices, yet we pretend we don't. And being insincere can appear as bad as being a defector. It can lead to us looking false and untrustworthy, and we've learned that the winners in life can sometimes be just like the best bluffers at poker. 
And because our information is imperfect, we can never really fully trust others. And this means we're always on the lookout for signs of deception. So we're careful about who we deal with. We keep the scores of our past exchanges in a mental ledger. And we spread gossip about how different people play. Nonetheless, the more trusting we and society become, and the more easy and efficient life is, the more we leave ourselves open to defect or attacks. These range from minor episodes such as free riding, to allowing hawkish types into our lives, to crime, and eventually to the really malign presence of bad men and sociopaths. The entire direction of our cultural development has been to arrive at philosophies that promote benevolent and admirable behavior and condemn selfishness and ego-driven choices. Defection is what we really mean by sin. Non-zero cooperation is the strategy that leads to what we now term morality. Always cooperate exchanges in society are seen as ethical. Trust and forgiveness aren't divine so much as game theoretic. And as for the altruism that's so evident in the natural world, we've repurposed this as a higher quality in us humans and defined it as the noblest of our virtues. More importantly, we humans have the ability, ability to imagine what others are thinking and to use the shadow of the future to weigh up the benefits that come from reciprocity. Defectors want gains returned immediately, but cooperators are playing a longer game, deliberately not snatching at being paid back. Instead, we allow debts and favours to build up in the expectation that things will come out in the wash if we're right about who we're trusting. But just how cross do we get when it turns out that this balancing process has got out of whack? Our sense of fairness and justice becomes outraged if what we're giving isn't being rewarded. Or like Pete and Tom, we discover that we've been taken advantage of. Game, game theory shows us that just as that genius Adam Smith had predicted, Trust and cooperation will grow in our societies as access to information, shared opinions, and efficient transport accelerate. This cocktail wildly expanded as literacy grew, the world recognized, and broadcast media became global. But information flows have exploded recently with the internet and continuous news and comment sites giving us instant updates. Citizens of the world are also communicating more than at any time in our history as home computer and smartphone use expands with common languages, free calls, social media, and translation services. The result, just as Smith and the great game, game theorists have predicted, the more that trustworthy information expands, the more connected we are, the more we'll cooperate, and the fairer the social contract will become. We may be hardwired for pessimism, but we're interconnected now as never before by super fast communication, by global trade, travel, immigration, internet services, cultural mixing, and an openness of debate. And with this collaborative momentum has come an increased acceptance of human rights, particularly among the young, with steep declines in racist, homophobic, religious, sexist, and hierarchical means, along with a rejection of cultural contempt, violence, knee-jerk bigotry, and the old instinctive distrust of strangers. At the same time, there have been all the game theoretic up upsides that come from the exposure of social dilemmas and unfair division, an incredible surge in innovation, mm -hmm. educational improvements, particularly for women, better health care, access to justice, individual freedom, security, and the basic conviction that the world cannot be happy if vast numbers of its people are not. I'm quite sure you're thinking if only. But in many ways, the proof of these improvements is to be seen where progress is being held back. These are almost always in countries which persist with top-down governance, strong man models, dictator dictatorial arrogance, theocracies, historical grievances, baseless racial superiority, and a fear of outside contact. These are all classic defector characteristics. Yet these rulers all see themselves as what Adam Smith used to call men of system, who think they can rule by moving individuals and events around as if they were pieces on a chessboard something that's never worked and is even less likely to do so in our ever more complex and collaborative world. I can only imagine that much of what I've said is stimulating a mass of what aboutery in your minds. So is there any hard evidence of cooperation expanding and of it leading to human progress? If you're like me, you probably feel the opposite and watching the news or reading a paper these days is rather like being bludgeoned. Some people even talk of living through a time of darkness and chaotic instability. 
But should we be so absorbed in our problems that we can't see the long-term trends? Maybe the big picture shows us how non-zero cooperation has evolved to reduce so many of the ills of our global society. So take the progress to be seen in just my lifetime. I'm a man in his mid seventies, but since I was born, the population of the world has roughly tripled while the population of people stuck in the United Nations definition of extreme poverty has fallen by 90% and has even halved in the last 20 years. Yet only 10% of us believe there's been any decline at all. Taking a shorter time period, just the last 50 years, the average human now earns nearly three times as much inflation adjusted money, eats one third more calories of food, buries a third less children, and can now expect to live one third longer. All this during a half century during which the world's population has more than doubled. When I was young, the population explosion was our climate change, the end of the world. Yet birth rates are down in every country now, largely led by improvements in the level of women's education and rights and their wish for newfound freedom and careers. As for food security, since my birth year, global agricultural yields have improved fivefold. 36% of the Earth's usable land area is now farmed. But if we had the same efficiencies and kit as we did even 50 years ago, we'd be plowing up 82%. Yet water use, nitrogen pollution, and soil erosion have all been falling worldwide as farmers learn of better practices. In the same period, per capita intake has risen to 2,700 calories, up from 2,100. Body heights have shot up, and obesity is now responsible for more global deaths from starvation. In my lifetime, the proportion of the world's people living in cities has nearly doubled from 30% to 56%. And by 2050, the UN expects its momentum to have taken the number to 80% or even higher. Yet these huge conurbations occupying about 3% of the world's ice-free area. And each city dweller has higher educational levels, lower carbon footprints, faster communication, more innovation, greater hygiene, better paid jobs, superior healthcare, fewer prejudices and more life opportunities than their counterparts on the land. Only 1.8 billion will be spread over rural areas by 2050, half the number that are there currently. And by then, over 30% of this landmass will be designated by their governments as protected places, wildernesses, or giant natural parks, up from the 18% it is today. Yes, the rich have got richer in the last 50 years, but the poor have done even better, with their consumption growing twice as fast as the world as a whole. The 1.4 billion Chinese, as an example, are on average 10 times as rich and 28 years longer lived than they were 50 years ago. Extreme poverty there has fallen from 42% to under 1%. India, with its similar population, was also at 42%. Now it's at 12%. And at the same time, the 650 million in Latin America went from 40% to 4%. The UN concludes that in the past half century, Incomes have risen faster in real terms among the world's poorest people than they had in the previous half millennium. When I was young, countries that were true democracies with universal suffrage could be counted on the fingers of one's hands. By the late 1970s, there was reckoned to be around 40. And during the 1980s, autocracy still greatly outnumbered other political systems. Even as recently as 30 years ago, only 28% of the world's population would have lived in open states. Now about two thirds of the globe's 200 odd countries are democracies. As for those not living in one, over 90% are in China and Russia. Fascism, communism, socialism, despotism, and nationalism have all been largely replaced by more open, free, information-based systems with far greater respect for their citizens' bottom-up wishes. Anything else? Well, the world has now virtually eradicated legalized slavery, greatly reduced capital and corporal punishment, Child labor and abuse has fallen sharply. Nearly 90% of people can now get their water from a protected source, have access to electricity, and see their children receive vaccinations. Female unemployment has shot up. Workplace injuries have plummeted. Workers generally retire earlier. And perhaps most importantly, entire killer diseases have been all but wiped out. Computer predictions and fast response services mean that the number of people dying from catastrophes like famine and drought and now under 5% of where they were when I was born. And the introduction of vaccines alone are reckoned to have saved more lives in the 20th century 
than all the deaths that came from the virtually continuous warfare. Set against this, of course, climate change is a colossal challenge, but it's certainly now got everyone's attention and it's primary concern of most governments. And there are any number of initiatives that confront it. I know, I know. How was the talk last night? Oh, a complete waste of time. An absurd Pollyanna told us everything was fine in the world. No, I'm not saying that. Of course, there are whole mountain ranges of challenges. But game theorists tell us that the world's people have never been as well informed as they are today, and that non-zero cooperation has mushroomed in an interdependent world. Now we hear about things, often things that rulers used to keep hidden. We make our own minds up, and we ensure that our views are heard. 50 years ago, researchers found that only 12% of us would answer yes to a question about whether we had any importance as individuals. Today, the same question elicits responses above 85%. We're better connected than ever. We're more aware. We have a collective intelligence, and we know if we collaborate, we can bring about solutions. Is everything okay? No. But the greatest single change of my lifetime has been our, greatest, uh, has been our growing expectation of, no demand for, change itself. Of course, hearing about progress makes most of us furious because it implies complacency. And that means there's less urgency when there's still so much to be done. And forward steps don't satisfy us other either because they only seem to expose yet further injustices and inequalities. But the global knowledge that we're not in a zero sum one-off game, like when you shouted out above the ivy, keeps spreading. The world's in it together now. And while the colossal Pete Tom adjustments to the social contract are behind so much of the turmoil we're witnessing, and it'll continue to scare us witless, behind all this, we can be sure that the game theorists are right and that cooperation will continue to expand. Why is that? Because now, as ever, it's always been the winning strategy. There you have it. Thank you very, very much indeed uh, for that. Uh, so I'll ask Andreas to look after the questions. Yes, so what a tour de force through game theory for Neumann, prisoner's dilemma, cooperation. So I think if we sum it all up, the secret to a successful life is to cooperate with yourself, others, and those other creatures and environments around you. Seems to be the, the key message. Right, we've got time for questions of which i'm sure there will be many we'll start in the room and then we go online as well so this gentleman here if you could speak directly into the mic yeah i did enjoy your last section um so positive uh for about 50 years i've been worried about climate change and i've been shocked at how little we've responded to that and sure enough i do see cooperation and people making strides to uh, mitigate the problem. But I'm still stuck, and I'm just wondering to what extent does the um, game theory apply here? Because um, people, yeah, they're, they're disinclined to take individual responsibility, like stop flying on your holidays, and uh, while uh, they're still building uh, coal-fired um, stations in China and so why should we do our individual bits why should I spend uh, 20,000 on an air source heat pump when nobody else is bothered let me stay here because I have to think um, I'm not sure nobody's bothered is absolutely accurate I think one of the things we have now is a lot of pessimism uh, and uh, pessimism is great because pessimism is uh, not being comfortable with the status quo. Pessimism is, is people raising objections. Pessimism is people like yourself coming along and saying, what's going on? You know, um, I was a bit like you, to be frank, in, in thinking uh, government's bad, individuals good, and so on. And, and I did a great deal of work, and it's in the last book there, about climate change and, and um, what was going on. And various things come out of it. I mean, the one thing that, that has to be said is that where countries are trying, they do make amazing progress. And, and actually, I mean, I know we slam our politicians, but the UK is actually a, a kind of outlier on this. And we're doing a lot here. And, and we're, in global terms, doing a lot. What happens, though, when you get somebody like 
China, who, who not only have coal-fired power stations, but dig it up, and it's very dirty coal. And when the absurdity of buying an electric car from China when it's been made with energy that was created by coal is, the, I think the last I saw that most models, petrol cars have to be driven something like 80,000 miles before they become less efficient than an electric car. I mean, the whole thing is an absolute scam. Anyway, but the point is, and it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, about reputation. I mean, China's got a terrible reputation now. And it's not just there. It's unauthorized fishing. It's uh, terrible human rights. I mean, they, they cut down on uh, Muslims and they uh, reduce the position. It's almost impossible to believe that they should have something successful in Hong Kong and then try and ruin it. So the end result of that is that their reputation suffers. I mean, if one goes back 20 years. China was a really interesting place we all wanted to go for on our holidays, have a look and see. And as the great PJ O'Rourke said, how, how did China do it? Did a billion people get MBAs? No. I mean, they, the Chinese just did what Adam Smith told them to do, and, and it opened the whole place up. And I mean, it's a tragedy, really, that Mr. Chi thinks that he can now put it all back together again. And they, they have terrible ways of social control. Huge shame. So the, the answer is that people like yourself say things in meetings, which we all agree with, and... Chinese are going to get the message. They have got the message. They know that. I think there's concern. Uh, and it'll, it'll continue. They will be hurt. I mean, the people like us in America, much more important, who are shutting down. People who used to have influence in Africa, where the Chinese have been buying influence and so on. So your question about, you know, why should I do anything when other, when other people do... It's hard to answer, really, except we know that it does work. The other day, I was interesting. I was reading um, Martha Gellhorn, who's somebody I greatly admire, and she was writing these are essays she was writing from through the 30s, before she was a war correspondent, and then through into the read her stuff from the 1930s. I mean, what was happening in places like Spain, which we now regard as absolutely blistering cooperation cooperators? You know, they were fascists in a way which nobody is now. I mean, the, the belief of people, common man in Spain, uh, against uh, Republicans was absolutely unreal. And things do change. That's the message. That's the bit that one really takes heart from. The more history I read, the more I tell. Funny enough, I was reading about the very first war. I was reading a book on, on the dreadnoughts and then the building of the fleet and so on. What was going on before the first war was... 50 times what's going on in Ukraine and, and uh, people, and these are defectors, they simply, I mean, the whole nature of the defector mindset is he doesn't understand cooperation. He just thinks other people ought to do what they're told. That's how they work. It's like Mr. Putin. He has no idea about social cooperation because he could never be the, the inferior part. <laughs> he could never be the, I can't remember if it was Pete or Tom, he can never do that. He has to win. He has to, he has to be the boss man. And, and he might win, but only for a bit. We now know that he won't win forever. We will. Cheer up. Yes, and in ah! exactly. And in philosophy, there is a concept called phronesis, which is practical wisdom. And the ancient Greeks described that as basically doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. And that's why you're doing it at the individual level. What are you doing? Okay, next question. Um, great talk, thank you very much. Oh, um, uh, I wondered if you could say, I'm sure you thought a lot about it, about religion, the wildcard religion, and, and the, what, how, you know, its place in all of this. Um, and also uh, the rational and the, the emotional, um, and how we can think things through and it all makes sense, but then the, we've got the emotional to, mm. and the emotional is very, very powerful. So there was that, but then also religion, you know, you talked about uh, reputation um, and um, uh, if you've got an all watchful eye, you know, it makes you behave better. So do you think religion evolved to make us more cooperative? Do you think there's an argument there? And then the other, the last thing is just, you talked a bit about nuclear bombs and um, just that, you know, if you think the afterlife is sweeter, then you're not afraid of pressing the button. Um, the four books, 
uh, start with Big Bang. Uh, and, uh, and what they're about is the narrative of life. I mean, everything that happens, something happened yesterday in the day. <laughs> and what interested me was to start right at the beginning. Uh, and book one is about how life ended up with us. You know, I mean, what was the chemistry? I mean, how did it ever become? Able? But book two is about how we got to be different. And the big man got in bloody early. And he's had his ha hand around our throats ever since. I mean, and, and, and so on. And the, what happened to us, made us different, happened in stages. You know, the first thing was walking and then running, running and then hunting. And hunting really elevated the big man because he controlled the hunt. And then we had fire, and fire meant we could cook food, and cook food meant we could, our brains expanded threefold. And that's why we had the mental energy, the mental power to invent language. Language was kind of grunts and things like that, and then it's, it's somewhere. Once we had language, then we had internal thought. Once we had internal thought, we started, well, what's going on? And how did I have a good day today? And what was happening? And we began to look for patterns. And, and the human mind's always looking for things that work together. And one can get pretty cynical once you realize that that's the process, because that's the stage where mythology was invented and pictorial uh, representations and religions. And this really suited the big man down to the ground because what it meant was that the, when things went wrong, it wasn't his fault. Uh, and it was really handy. And then when agriculture came and, and things mushroomed, the whole priest caste was, they were all in a racket. The priest caste looked after the bureaucrats, the bureaucrats looked at the, 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 and everything, the 3%, 5%, everything was against them. Now, when you read that, you, your religious uh, beliefs begin to get eroded because you think, God, you know, I think I worked out there was tens of thousands of hunter-gatherer tribes, all of whom would have had it. And the way that uh, they were diminished was because uh, these larger states invented aggressive warfare because the big man worked out if he could go in and wipe out the enemy, he could get rid of their religion and he could show that his religion was the right religion. He smashed their temples. That was always the first thing he did. And then he got their women to marry his men and, and so on. And then he just absorbed it. And, and so it was great. And uh, of course, the paradox is that the, 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 the more he did this, the more the peaceful zones expanded because it was cultural unifiers that had this. Now, it's quite tricky when you are as cool eyed as that to think that religions have a, have a place in it. In fact, you can go beyond that and say it was all part of the same racket. Now, it just so happens that I, I am actually fairly religious, but I have one which may not agree with yours, I mean, and, and, and so on. And in fact, there's a terrific paradox that we're all so, so, what's the word, courteous to each other now, but actually underneath it, it can't be all right. So, I mean, the whole thing is, is kind of an odd state of affairs. Now, to answer your more recent question, though, the uh, social movement to no religion has been incredibly fast, almost uh, about amongst the young. The people who answer they have no religion is now larger than Catholics in America. Uh, it's, it's, it's larger than believers in, in France and Australia. Um, and surprisingly, it's extremely fast in the Arab world. The, uh, even in, in, in Saudi Arabia, 5% of people are atheists, and 19% say that they actually have, have, have no belief in it. And that's more than ex-Catholics in Italy. And because you can't keep their heads down. Now, the question is, if large numbers of people, and, and by the way, Jimmy and I go to church, I mean, we're down to single figures, probably below most. And if people don't go along with organized religion or religious views, does that mean that they're unmoored from moral precepts? Does it mean they're terrified? No. In fact, the world's going the other way. The whole purpose of this speech was to show that we're increasing morality. And actually, God, you know, talk to my grandchildren. They're so right on. You have to be careful what you say. They are so moral and so believing. And so they're kind and nice and they really want a better world. They don't go much God bothering. And I think what the game theorists have showed us is... is now, uh, Richard Dawkins spent a career telling us that there's no God. And I mean, I don't know why he bothers, actually, because everything that you, you see once you get your head into it is possible without a God. That doesn't mean there isn't one. 
And that's the life of me, the mistake. You know, he's, he's so argumentative and he's so angry that he has to smash bishops and so on. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he does it, frankly, because um, if you read about you know, how life began, it, it was so far-fetched. I mean, the chances of it happening are so improbable. I mean, Salvador Dali, when, when they discovered how DNA worked, he said, that's the, that's the proof of God. You know, it's just so bizarre. And uh, I don't know why people talk about uh, uh, God in terms of recent things. They ought to go back and look at the microbiology and the subatomic particles and things like that. Actually, I think that subatomic particles behave exactly in the way that mystics talk about God being in all places and <laughs> all seeing and disappearing when he wants to and so on. So, anyway, it's a rambling answer. But... Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh. um, okay, so there was a couple of things. I, I'm interested in what you said. And one of the thing was about information. So the more information we've got, the more we can be cooperative. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Um, but what I find nowadays is it's almost like different blocks of information. So if you're on the internet, the algorithms make it that the information you get is um, confirmation bias. You see what you want to see. So we have tribes of people believing this and people believing that. Yes. And what I also see, crikey, there's lots of things, is the rise of the far right globally. The, the rise of the far right. Yes. All over the world this is happening. Um, who owns the media, who disseminates information, is all linked to the rise of the far right. Um, also, when you said, like, in the past 70 years, this has happened, this has happened. In the past 50 years, this has happened, this has happened. But in the last 20 years, I've seen a massive decline. In this country, um, access to free university education, um, access to a GP within four weeks, um, trade unions, employment law, um, environmentally, the state of our waterways in this country. And... I see more um, divisiveness, more tribalism, and more um, defecting and self-interest. So I'm quite interested, just chucking all that at you, <laughs> what you can say. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure you're right, to be frank. Um, I think what we read is exactly what you say. Uh, and I think that the, the, what we read is, is what I was saying to this gentleman earlier. This, this is a dark view of where we're going. Um, uh, and that helps the process. The uh, great English uh, biologist, John Maynard Smith, I mentioned him earlier, came up with this view that um, if there were so many mutations, he was saying, you know, we, things were changing, and mutation changes. Why did things stay the same? It was, a, it was a good question to ask. And he said it was because everything in nature is attempting to stay in what he called an evolutionary stable state, an ESS. Uh, and it was always under, under attack. It was under attack because it was mutating itself. It was under attack because there were other species trying to get into its niche and they were mutating all the time. And it was under attack because different members of those species were trying to get. And it was mostly under attack because the environment could change. Just suddenly everything that they had. Now, it's my view that what, what we're living through is humanity trying to establish an ESS. And these questions, we are under attack, but that doesn't mean... <laughs> Failing. What an ESS is, is a, is, is a mechanism for staying at peak fitness. And one of Maynard Smith's investigations was, was into animal conflict. Why did uh, animals like stags, stags was the, what he picked on, but other things, particularly males, fight? But the weird thing is, they didn't actually do each other much harm. These were ritualized aggression. And, they were, and, and he came up with a view that what they were doing was a bit like um, 
when the SAS carry out attacks on people, they, what they're doing is they're testing their own systems. They're testing whether they're at peak fitness. I think we're going through that. We are under attack, and we ask ourselves questions and the issues that you raise, which need answers. In Russia and China and North Korea, they're not having these questions. That's, you see, Mr. Putin, that's why he sneers at us. That's why he thinks we're in decline. We're not in decline. He's in decline because he doesn't allow people to ask those questions, to have that debate, to have this sort of messy, rioting, confusing thing where everybody's shouting and we hope. It comes right. It's because what Maynard Smith said was when an organism was under attack, light begets light, he called it. If something better came along, then the organism would, would uh, change to adopt that. Uh, and that's how it stayed at peak fitness. And I, I, I didn't want to say it in this, but when I look back again at my lifetime, things, not, not, not just um, uh, wealth and, and property, anyway, but the way we thought about things has changed completely. I, I, I mean, the idea, um, if you thought about surgeons and solicitors, they were always men. Well, now they were, it's an absurd thing to say. Um, same-sex marriage, well, I mean, it's laughable stuff of, you know, we, things do come along, but one generation thinks of as, as absurd and the next generation adopts. Now, I think that a lot of what you're talking about uh, may lead to change, but um, a lot won't. And as for some of the inadequacies of the internet, things like that, it, it, it's bad business. Bad business for the people who control it to allow this to go on. Of course, it'll get sorted out. Or, or and I, I hasten to add, I think that a lot of people know what's fake and or have a pretty good guess at it. And you think not, but may disagree on that one. So again, another rambling answer. Okay, we've got one more question in the room. Then we go online, and uh, I'll pick somebody out next. Oh, here we go. Oh. Thank you very much for your talks. Most. Um enjoyable and, and stimulating. There's one minor issue I'd like to deal with. At the very early, you showed a slide that said, uh, talked about the, the um, second law of thermodynamics. Yes. Uh, now, now, frankly, that's nonsense. The second law of thermodynamics is about thermodynamics, nothing else. Uh, I've heard other people sort of bring this argument up. It doesn't wash. You can't make this analogy. Uh, but, but that's a, a thing I'd like to put to one side and say, uh, the, really, the lady at the back, I mean, in a way, stole a lot of what I'd like to say. I agree entirely that there has been a huge advance, and, and something like Stephen Pinker's Our Better Angels show how things have advanced enormously yep. uh, through the millennia of, of, of human uh, civilization. Yep. But I think we would be naive if we didn't think we are in a particularly naive, uh, we would be naive if we didn't think we were in a particularly dodgy situation at the moment. I think there are people gaming this system. They are game players. And I, I think you're being very naive about uh, the internet. Those people are gaming us. Yeah. They are making vast fortunes. And I think it's, it's a pity that, that you're not sort of accepting that although things have made a lot of progress, and I believe we'll go on making progress, at the moment we're at a dangerous corner. Well, I don't think there's ever been a stage where men wouldn't say that we're a particularly dangerous stage. I think it's deep within us all to think that, the, God, when you think of our parents' generation, what they lived, I mean, you know, we're living, what was a wonderful French journalist who said the French think that they're living in hell when actually they live in paradise. You know, it's, it, it is true. We, we have fantastic times. What um, my answer is that you may well be right. Uh, and it may well be that we have to go through another turn of the circle. Now, what does this circle look like? Well, if you if you take cooperators and defectors, I mean, the, the, and there are mixed strategies and they're dealing with each other. But by and large, we favour always cooperate because it's an easier life and we get along and it's a trust-based system and so on. You have those kind of societies, but they're always under attack in exactly the way that you say, and they're under attack from minor crimes like free riding, or they might be under attack from um, that car park taking nine quid off. You know, I mean, these are minor things and so on. But 
what society does by and large is to police those and to try and keep the lid on it. Now, where that, where that doesn't persist or where society fails to do that, then you do get defectors ganging up. There's no question about it. And one can see that. I mean, you take Russia. I mean, it's a defector state. It's a top-down um, state with, with a, the mafia state, you know, big gangsters at the top and then the, so on and so forth. Now, what happens when, when that happens is you do get an always defect state. But, but the great weakness of always defect states is that when they, what I was saying, when they overcome the cooperators, when, when they've sneered and, and, and taken them out and, and now react, they, they have their own weaknesses. Reciprocity has to be returned immediately. That's the kind of definition of mafia state. They turn on each other. We know that's the end of the story for these places. And what happens is that as they become internally weakened and corrupted inside, the retaliator dubs do begin to appear, both from outside and inside and so on and, and so on. I mean, take Russia. There are lots of people in Russia who know what goes on in free societies. It was a fantastic story, I remember, when, when it was Soviets and there was some terrific million man march in Washington and all the Soviet papers ran stories showing see the Americans hate their government as far as I could see people with placards you know, so they hate their governments everybody said boy their jails must be big surely the leaders are being dragged out and shot surely they're a knock on the door for everybody surely they've been taken but these men are being rounded up and so on and then the penny dropped no they're allowed to be so it, it, these, these states can be undermined with its people understanding that there, there are cooperating societies, free societies, societies which may look like them. Mr. Putin rails, doesn't he, against the decline, uh, decadence and, and so on. I don't. I think it's people having a point of view. And I, in the great marketplace of life, some of those views will, will, will persist and may be, in, in, be dangerous. Others will be countered, like will beget like. Society will continue to be at peak fitness. Now, you can go through bad patches, no question about it. You go round the side. Every time you get to the top again, and, they, and you get to always cooperate, you ratchet up. That's the beauty of this system. You know, our grandparents weren't very nice. Our parents, <laughs> we are nice, but our children are much nicer. Than our grand it's, it's kind of epigenetic. We are learning morality, even as we watch it. I think we have to cheer up. Okay, we've got a question really online from Trevor. He wants you to expand on your comment, it's rational to be irrational. Could you please expand on that? Yes. Um, where you have a one-off game, it's rational to defect. Uh, if you want to see this, there's a fantastic piece of footage for a game called Golden Balls, where two people have to come to an agreement. Uh, and they can betray each other. Now, there is no question that you should betray. In a one-time game where you don't know the other person, you're never going to see them again, it should be a zero-sum solution. But when you do know people, then it becomes, you, you have to behave irrationally and trust. Because if you trust somebody and they trust you back and you then have an always cooperate relationship, life becomes easier. You're sharing six, well, the whole beauty of the prisoner's dilemma was that the most you'll never get as an individual is five points. But you can get six points as a pair by cooperating. And there's no friction in these relationships. It's easy. You're not, you're not suspicious. And uh, people would say, well, that's irrational. I mean, I know people. I never trust anybody. So, no, never lie. And there's nothing you can say. That's the, the, the outlook. But you have to say that that is not a game theoretic solution. It, it may be irrational, but it does work. I hope that. Okay. Another question in the room, and then we probably need to wrap it up. We may have enough room for one more question after this, if you keep this one short. Oh, you know me. I can't ever keep anything short. I'm Robin Philpott. I'm an ex-psychiatrist. Well, retired psychiatrist. Um, I was wondering about uh, how people play games in their life as individuals. Um, because in my experience, people are playing lots of different games with lots of different people all the time, and they don't get things right often because they're overloaded with difficult choices. 
or choices that are at variance with each other. That's the first point. The second point is, do young people play games the same as old people? Do people change how they play games as they get older and actually possibly become more inefficient rather than more efficient? Uh, I think that's one thing. And do men and women play games differently? And I think that what we're seeing in, at the present time is a massive change, feminization of how society is structuring itself and thinking about it. Uh, and we must not forget that everybody remembers Darwin talking about the survival of the fittest, but he had a very huge emphasis on evolution by sexual selection. And it's females who make the selection, not males. And females are now making the, the selection by not choosing any males, which is why our population is... Well, I mean, this is one of the most extraordinary things of, uh, about the human race, is this the first species ever that chooses not to procreate. I mean, as Dawkins said, we override our genes. Uh, and that is the beauty and the curse of free will. We... we we didn't used to be like that, but we've, we've learned to. Now, back to your thing about we play different games with different people. Yeah, the thing about human beings and everything we do is we all have non-zero and zero-sum choices all the time. And, and one, of the, one of the reasons, I mean, I'm sure you're a wonderful person, you're a non-zero. I bet you wish that the tax man wasn't quite as efficient. Hey, you'll slip in a zero-sum game every now and then, grab five foot, as long as you're not spotted because if you're spotted then people think oh, that's bad and in fact if you are trusted and then you do something like oh you've looked at it's one of those weird things that bad people do bad things you think yeah that's right you did it oh i hadn't realized <laughs> it's so that's why we try and maintain a reputation you don't want to to, to what they say about brand reputations you can smash it in a day you can smash it in a minute you know anyway now, back to the thing about how we behave with each other. We do have what I call mental ledgers. We are behaving with each other. And one of the things we do is we, we build up debts and favors. We, uh, that's how cooperation works. We don't want reciprocity each time. You know, you lend me a five, I'll give it back to you this evening and that sort of thing. Yeah, don't worry, it'll all come out. And when it doesn't, then we really do feel damaged. I mean, there are a few things. Uh, worse than being let down by a close friend. I mean, th th this is catastrophic of our view of humanity and, and so on. Now, how do we uh, behave? Yes, we're all, of course, we're playing games with different people all the time. And, 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 and Darwin was, or, or the um, biologists are right about what they call kin selection. We favor families because we share genes and, and therefore we tend to cooperate more. And again, in, Darwin's, um, Dawkins, well, we do that far less. But in the old days, you think of the ruling families. It always ran families because they shared those genes. And, um, and then there were people who were strangers. You would deal completely differently with them. Uh, sorry. Well, it's quite interesting. There was a man, uh, it's absolutely fascinating, all this, because the, the, the question is, uh, Dar Darwin said, when a man does a, a great deed, an altruistic deed, um, and, he, and is killed, his altruistic genes die with him. He didn't call them genes, but nature, I think he said. And this was the accepted view of biologists. That's why altruism couldn't work, because they would be come out of the genome. And then, sorry, we... Well, I think we there's one hand was raised and one more question. Okay, yes. So we think we need yeah, to move very, on. Very, very quickly then. But uh, um, the question then was about what are known as eusocial insects, ants, termites, wasps, bees. These have many more females than males because what they've done is, you think that what the gene is trying to do, survive and reproduce. But what these have done is they've separated them out. And so some members of the colony just do the survival bit. And other members of the colony do the reproduction bit. You take a beehive, the queen bee does all that. And, and the worker bees, uh, they might have uh, uh, offspring, but they're only uh, um, drones. So the reason a great biologist called Bill Hampton came up with this thing was, was uh, he, he said Darwin was wrong. 
when people when when um, they don't leave the gene pool because what you've done is uh, uh, organisms at your level, not your children, because don't forget, in sexual reproduction, you lose half your genes. It, 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 but at your level, you, you share more genes. Um, what, he, what he said was, he came up with a formula, which was the degree of relatedness and the amount of genes that goes through to the gene pool. Okay, I think we need to move on to the final question. And, and, it and, needs to be a very quick question and a very quick answer, so we could finish at nine o'clock. Uh, pressure. Um, well, I'll, I'll make this very, very quick. It's more of a um, synthesis of a couple of perspectives and actually leaves me with another positive thought that you've put in my head. And I want you to reflect on it, which is so the, the fundamental bit about rationality and irrationality. You take people like Daniel Kahneman, you know, they all say that we are fundamentally not rational. Actually, to weave into this other point about, you know, what is existential risk? There's a guy, uh, Toby Ord, Professor Toby Ord, who does a lot in this world, and he will say by a country mile empirically, the biggest risk that faces us is misaligned AI. So I was keen for a, a positive reflection is, if we have misaligned, if we have AI, we would hope it will be the most fundamentally rational agent <laughs> there could be that hopefully understands game theory, determines that uh, we should uh, you know, cooperate and we should be less worried about misaligned AI. And I just wondered if that is a positive uh, joining up of some of the dots. Well, I don't know. I think AI might end up doing people's jobs for them, and that's got to be good with you know, robotics doing horrible jobs and, and, and fantastic. My son read AI at the university. He says, I don't know why we're talking about it. It's all over. It's yeah, all over. I don't know. I mean, you know, people can wrap it on about it. It's well past the point of no return. We've had it. So, great. That will cheer you up. Um, what... Um, uh, what's my way? Apologies. What, what was the other thing? I mean, fundamentally, um, the, the risk of AI that it will be the most uber uh, agent of rationality is obviously it's, it's maybe less. Risky. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you. I was for many years chairman of an online gambling company deep in breath, and it was a very large. We had, I think, one of the largest poker uh, um, things. And um, von Neumann always used to say, he was our game theorist. Well, you, do you, do you mean like chess? So you know, chess is exactly what I don't mean. Chess is chess is a computation. There must be a right move. No, no, I mean poker. Poker is that people don't know what you're up to. You don't know. You're bluffing. You know, does he think that I think that they think that you know, and so on? And people form into alliances. And so that's what games are about. Uh, and and uh, the, the one thing that we knew. Uh, Big Blue might beat people, might beat the world champion at chess, but nobody could beat us humans at poker. I saw some of my old friends the other day, and I said, do you think that's still true? He said, oh, no, we're way past that. Way past that. You know, the AI is, uh, that's why all these poker sites have gone. Right, I think at this point, we now need to draw matters to a conclusion. But any talk that can cover off game theory, von Neumann machines, tit for tat, uh, Prisoner's Dilemma, Religion and AI in an hour and a half is fantastic. So please put your hands together for Sean.